No, I saw you talk, but I didn't hear anything. But that might just be me. How about for everybody else? Same. Nice background, Lane. Thank you. Uh, I think that's Zoom provided. I don't think I did anything special to get it. So I can't hear you. I think Lance or can you hear oh, no. me or I hear you now. Can you hear me? I hear Lance. Oh, I yeah. think I can't hear, hear anyone. Lance. Yeah, <laughs> it's you. I still can't hear you. How about, about now? How about now? Oh, whoa, now, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Seems like we have a very small crowd today. Not sure if this is because of the new link or because there's some event today. Does anyone know that? No, I'm not aware of anything. Uh, James had a late night last night. Ah. <laughs> I think, yeah, what, what time is this for you? It's quite early, right? Or Yeah, it was a little later, and then the time switch happened. It's, eight, it's nine o'clock now. I think seven for him, though. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's quite early. Um, so I think we're now at... Uh, I'm always in conflict with time zones. Um, we can probably see this at Hyperledger. Uh, it's now anchored in UTC minus eight. And I'll update that one. Okay, cool. I think we can get started. Small crowd today, but uh, that shouldn't. But a good one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, welcome everyone to the Airstream JavaScript call of uh, March 30th. Uh, need to remember you to abide by the Hyperledge Code of Conduct and the Antitrust Policy. If you would like to add yourself to the attendees list, feel free to do so. Um, I've shared the link in chat. I can send it again. Um, is there anyone new here today that would like to introduce themselves? I think I recognize all names. All right, um, 
Ben, um, let me see. Status updates. Um, was the bifold call this week? Uh, do you know that, Ryan? Uh, yes, it was a short one, though. Mostly uh, just catching up on some uh, open PRs. And uh, I believe the restructuring PR uh, got merged in yesterday, last night. OK, yeah, I was happy and sad for that at the same time, because it's nice that it's been done, but it means I have to probably update my PR and there's a lot of merge conflicts, uh, I would expect. Yeah, OK, so that's going to be fun. Um, let me see, restructuring of repo to mono repo or workspace. Merged. Cool. Okay. Um, any other status updates? Does someone at the Airways Working Group call this week? Um, yes, I was in there. Um, Stephen hosted. Trying to remember. Yeah. Uh, so, some, uh, Stephen hosted, right? Yeah. It was a presentation from Thomas. Yes, right, from, from Nessus. So yeah, Thomas Tesler did his presentation of his um, Nessus um, command line client. Uh, that's very nice. It's got autocomplete and aliasing and a bunch of other things, uh, essentially for doing um, the W3C verifiable credential scenario that talks about like an airport scenario of traveling with a miner. Uh, and yeah, it's a really nice demo and it's improving all the time. Um, so the communications, um, that he's building towards, uh, or did V2 and the did V2 protocols for issue credential and things like that. Um, and that demo, uh, has did V2 support, but also did V1. Um, he shows, uh, like interactions with like Occupy, uh, as well. So, it's um, yeah, it's a really nice demo, super nice client. Um, definitely would be very useful for like just you know general demonstrations and things like that. Um, he's where uh, Roots ID. Well, I guess it's a good segue. Uh, essentially, the April uh, IW uh, we're doing a didcom v2 connectathon. That on there. And um, he won't be at IW, but um, we're gonna do like a recording with his scenario and, you know, kind of use that scenario to frame some of our interactions. Although most of what we'll be doing is just, you know, showing simple did come V2 between agents. So anyways, we have that document um, that, that we've put together so far for the participants and um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, because I think you decided now to do it during the demo hour, right? Uh, right. Yeah, we originally had we're going to do kind of a Roots ID specific uh, Didcom V2 demonstration, but uh, yeah, we couldn't decide if we were going to do a session or during do a, during the demo hour to have the connectathon, and we decided to do the connectathon during the demo hour. So, yeah, we'll we'll have uh, several participants uh, essentially demoing Didcom V2 connections. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Would have been. Would have loved to be there. We're we're doing another demo, so we can join. But uh, uh, yeah, would be interesting to see the results of that. Um, do you think there's a like of because I saw also some discussions in um, I think the Ditcom V2 channel on like that's still like interoperability or or maybe in the Ditcom V2 from Diff uh, Discord or something. But that interoperability is still quite hard to achieve. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, Fab, uh, Fabio Pinheiro, um, we've uh, worked with him quite a bit uh, recently for DICOM v2 stuff, and um, there are parts of the spec um, that there are some kind of interpretation type, uh, you know, situations, uh, and then also there's just certain situations that uh, a lot of us are basing our implementations, you know, on the SIGPA libraries, um, and so if someone kind of does their own implementation and they don't have the same assumptions or, or you know, the same implementation, there can be uh, roadblocks there for, for interop. 
but um, that's exactly why we want to do this. Uh, you know, the big movement right now in DIF and, and Aries for DIDCOM V2 is to have as many agents and services and mediators interacting over DIDCOM V2 to kind of ferret out these interop issues that can occur because DIDCOM V2 is so, uh, well, it's broad in, in the sense of everything that it could possibly do. Uh, and then you have your additional protocols and things like that. So any other things, Roto, maybe that you want to? No, that, that's that? fine. That So it's not a problem of difficulty because uh, fixing the, the problems is really easy, but just to agree how we interpret if we send it from Heather or not. So this kind of, of things that maybe someone reading the spec just implement one way and the other implement the other ways. I need to see all the little details on the spec that say optional or not optional and trying to understand what, what is the correct way to, to do the things. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, from Fabio's point of view, you know, he's, he's really diving deep into it uh, and asking hard questions questions uh so that's good or challenging i guess us to all you know improve which is great um so, and, and i think you know in some ways he was kind of like oh you know sorry if i'm kind of messing up your connectathon type thing but you know from my point of view this is exactly what we want to do right i want i want us to fail early and often uh and and just improve so I think, um, yeah, we'll show quite a bit of good interop, and then, yeah, we're going to learn a lot, too. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. That's uh, like you, you can't, uh, you have to first go through the phase of every, everything doesn't work before you can get to a phase where everything does work because you have done the work to to test it with each other. That's, uh, uh, yeah. As we all have learned, probably nothing is interoperable from the start, even with standards. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Okay. Anything else on DitConv2 or AFP3? Uh... All right. Um, then for the uh, agenda for today, I wanted to discuss uh, some of the open PRs and issues for the zero for zero release. Um, uh, have a short discussion about JSON LD, uh, credential and AFJ, and uh, this was over from last week. Is continuing the conversation about prioritization for um, zero five zero. Um, any other topics we want to add to the agenda? I guess that's a no. All right. Um, yeah, for this one, I just wanted to quickly go through. I've had some people ask, like, what's left for AFJ 040? When can, uh, when can we release it? Um, my answer is always hopefully soon um, because that's it's always difficult. Um, but maybe we can go through the list and see, like, what's really needed. Um, Timo, or, um, before you yes. do that, can I just interrupt and ask a quick question? Um, uh, you yes, may have sir. seen, um, I think you heard from Amit, he's put a PR in this morning related to the BBS module, right? And that's a, that was a 033 problem. So my question is this, we, we've been doing some testing this week, or at least the ODS guys have been doing some wallet testing, and we have like three changes we need to make that are in, to the 033 branch. Um, we've had a couple of bugs and so on. So the question then is, if we want to patch, do a patch release for 033, how do, how do we how would we go about doing that? Would we just pull out the 033 release and, and put a pull request in for those changes? What would you recommend? Uh, yeah, because you, you don't want to do it for the 04 release that is upcoming. Um, let me think. Two of them yeah, are actually going to be bugs in 040 as well. Uh, What's the third one? Um, actually, possibly, or maybe just just all three need to go in. Um, I'll have a look, but that, is that the easiest thing then? Just put a pull request into main. Yeah, I think then we can include them in zero four zero or zero four one because we don't really have the pipeline correctly set up to easily make 
patches right. for old releases. We had that with the with the the release with 03, but that was a lot of overhead. Uh, and then we made the decision to make releases more often. And then that obviously didn't work. Um, um, but yeah, I think if you can do it to main, then- I can uh, do that. But then my question would be, if they're going to run with 0, 033 in, in, their, in their ODS wallet, how will those changes sort of um, propagate back to the release that they're using? Because they need, I think my understanding is they need this done like in 033 by tomorrow. So it's not clear to me how that, that will go in. Then, uh, then yeah, that's not possible. Then um, someone would need to put in the work to update the Airstream JavaScript pipelines and make sure we can have another branch where we can release from yeah. instead of like the current alpha release. So, Ooh. ouch. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, Mm, not I'm not sure how we handle this then because I don't think they're in a position to be able to go to zero four zero. Just to as a word of explanation, they're testing JSON LD credentials issue credentials um, using zero three three. And uh, as I say, we found a few little things in the code, mostly small. I think I sent you a message this morning. One of them was, was a question. The other two, I definitely know, are bugs that need to fix. I mean, one was like really trivial. We missed a V out of the. Uh, else lvc detail you know format string we'd literally missed one character off that's obviously going to be wrong in all releases so we certainly need to fix it for for the 040 release and i can do that i can put a pull request in for that It'll, it's quite small but it's not clear to me how we get the fixes in for the code base they're using are, are you saying they really need to go to 040 but that's not released yet so it's not clear to me how we get a patch out to them but that, that's what there, maybe there is an, another possibility that could be to to create a branch for 03x and put all these fixes there. I mean, review them and and and, and, and put put the fixes there. And even if we don't have the pipelines to to make a an official release on on npm, maybe that can be helpful for them to apply a patch locally with the patch package uh, re package <laughs> i don't know it, 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 uh, of course it's not ideal but it's something that we can achieve uh, soon yeah that may work uh, i'm thinking can you specify a path in a package json because if so we could just um in the Branch. We could probably start from this one. This is the latest one before we went to uh, uh, zero four zero. Um, the first one um, that we, um, if we can publish the build TypeScript, like the build files to here, that you can also install just from a GitHub repo, I think. But I don't know how that works with mono repos and sub pads. Mm. You're right. So, yeah, I mean, maybe it's possible. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we would need to at least go to 3, 4, alpha 17. When at the moment, they're on 3, 3, alpha 9, I think. It's my understanding. I think that's right, Tim. I'm not sure if you if you know that. But um, so if we patch into that, what do we, could we create a 0, 3, 4, alpha 18 and then just use that? I, I don't know how that's going to work. I, I've never done one of these GitHub patch releases before. Um, yeah, so that won't work automatically. We that's that's what I meant. Like somebody would need to look at the, the workflow because we have like a continuous integration, and yeah. at yeah. the bottom somewhere we have uh, a portion stable. Uh, it's probably in the continuous deployment. We have like a release canary, um, but that just looks at, I think. Yeah, it has a script to get the next bump and, and basically uh, know like which version, um, but it does that by looking at the, the GitHub tags. And so um, it will not like make a 0, 3, 4, but it will actually be a 0, 4, 0 uh, alpha release because that's currently what's also being used to on every commit release a new alpha version. So I think what Ariel said to make a patch, um, like have a, 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 we could make a branch here with like the changes, but you would need to build and pack it locally and then just add like the, 
the file, uh, uh, like the, the tar with a, uh, like an NPM file link to your repo and use that instead of downloading it from NPM. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether that's going to be uh, good enough for, for what uh, ODS want to do with their, this is, I mean, Tim, is this going to be, this is going to be production code soon, isn't it? So. No, we're okay. I, I don't, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe what we'll do is we, we can just fix it locally and, and get these fixes into the 4.0 as well at this yeah, point. That would be the easiest thing. I think just before you arrived, Tim, we were saying that the, the, these fixes would need to go into 040 anyway. They are bugs that are going to, at least two of them. I think one of them, I, I, I looked at my code earlier on and it's it's already done. Um, but two of the three that I, that I want to fix would need to go into 040. So should we yeah. just do a 040 fix then? Yeah, that's not, that's not make, I don't want to make it complicated for us, the community on this. So um, yeah, we're not okay. that, under that time pressure. Okay. All right. All right. There you go, Timo. I'll I'll put a patch request in for the current zero four zero release, and then we don't need to worry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate. Right. It. Um. Yeah. I think uh, right. we 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 want to have a bit better like uh man release managers for like older releases, but it's always a lot of overhead, and we just need to yeah revamp the pipeline a bit so it's easier to do patch releases um when it's really needed because yeah. yeah. Sure, but it looks like on this occasion we we can we can just put them into zero four zero, so that's fine. But when when we start when you start getting multiple production releases, and it gets bigger and bigger, and there are loads of people, all on, it's gonna it you know, quickly starts to get very difficult to manage, doesn't it? Because you've got you know various releases of of AFJ that are being used in production all over the place, and you're gonna you're gonna need to be able to patch them. Uh, on that release, but I guess that can be. That's not. That's not what we need to do now. So okay, I'll I'll, I'll look at zero four zero then. Thank you, Timo. Cool. Okay. Perfect. Um, let's hope we can just release zero four zero really soon. Um, so um, if we look at the list um, of what's still out there, um, we have. I think maybe this is a good one to discuss. Um, which there's like we had a default cache implementation which worked well for mobile devices, but not specifically for server-side environments. Um, so I made a PR to change it to an in-memory cache by default, which is in mobile devices not really useful. Um, because whenever you close the wallet, you'll lose your whole cache. So um in mobile devices you probably want the single context which is just like you have a uh like a cache that is for each um wallet um um where we can store like the resolved dit uh uh the resolved dates it's mostly used for the dates and which ledgers associated with it but ariel made a comment which makes sense a bit like um um yeah, maybe it's not the best to move away from single context, especially not uh, if not in mobile environments, I think. So um, do we just want to keep it at the single context storage LRE cache? I think for like, if you have a single tenant server deployment, it also just works fine. It's just that it breaks when used in multi-tenancy. So by default, if you add the multi-tenancy module, uh, you'll have a broken state for the agent. Um, so we either need to do be a bit smarter that when you use the tenancy, multi-tenancy module that we automatically switch the cache implementation. But I think it's also quite standard for things to just say like by default, we have a very simple in-memory cache. And if you want something more sophisticated, you can, well, either implement your own with Redis, for example, or we provide another implementation for mobile devices. But yeah, I'm uh, also fine with just keeping it. I don't know if somebody has opinions on this or uh, Ariel, would you, uh, if you have anything to add here? No, may maybe my, my main concern is that uh... I'm not sure, but I will say that 99% of AFJ users are using it for mobile environments or single tenancy uh, servers. Uh, 
Yeah. So if we are going to modify something because of that uh, particular uh, use case, maybe it can change in the future. But uh, 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 for that time, I mean, I think it's like that. And, and I agree that uh, it's technically correct to do this uh, default in-memory implementation. But we have to make sure that when somebody uh, upgrades their AFJ for mobile environments, they will use uh, this uh, single context storage cache instead of the in-memory one. Because you know what will happen. <laughs> People will tend to use the the, the default one because uh, it's easier to set up and also we hope because they have a lot of things to think about when migrating to AFA 04 or, or or so and they will see that it works the the, the agent runs and it, it, it's fine and then when they figure out that they were using a, this, this in-memory cache is uh, it's late. I mean, <laughs> they will they will already be in production status. So that that's why my I had this uh, uh, comment in the, some weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I think makes sense. I think uh, currently in multi tenancy it will throw an error and you can just fix that um and while you won't notice anything in mobile environments if you're using an in memory cache and it's just every, every time you close the app it's completely gone and uh yeah most people use uh it in mobile environment so i think i uh, agree um in that case i think we can just close this pr and maybe if we want to re revisit it at a later stage to either have a more advanced uh, uh like way to pick the default for example in in server we do use in memory for example and then other ones not but yeah uh, then we just like skip it for now Is oh, okay i it? think it's going to be to actually create an interface so that you can do either or um to do what you're talking about because is it a heavy lift or is this a more involved or is this simple enough that we can we can do both if that makes sense um it's uh like the you just have like you now have a cache module in afj where you provide the cache implementation and that's an interface with a few methods like set get um um remove all something like that um and we have two default implementations and it's just like the default that we have um um uh provided in in afj so like setting it up and switching between the two is these two implementing your own is a bit more uh involved but i think yeah you would probably within an hour you would be able to link it to a redis uh, uh cache for example okay so i guess to clarify for my understanding that is the uh someone's not blocked so if they want to do multi-tenancy they could do so, but we're talking about here of what's the default and we're thinking of keep, keeping the default the same. Yeah, yeah. So we are using multi-tenancy, for example, we just define currently, we define the cache module um, uh, and we specify an in-memory uh, or an, an, an Redis uh, cache as the backend. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's just swappable. So it's just about the default, what's used if you don't define anything. Cool. I, I agree with the thought process of closing the PR then. Okay. Thank you for right. explaining. And do you need a default? Because if you don't put a default, you force all implementers to pick one. So you... Yeah, yeah and I agree that there's, since the large majority of users are going to use the um, persistent one, I think it makes sense to make that the default uh, versus the in-memory. Okay, yeah, I think we can do not require a default, but uh, I think there's already quite some things you need to configure. So if we can like take away, if we can provide a default that works for most people, I think, yeah, that that's probably good. All right, then I'm going to close this PR.
uh, and I'm going to close this issue. We can revisit it when needed. And then we have one lab task um, removed from the to-do list. Um, all right, I think this one, and maybe we want to uh, um, postpone it to a later release. I think that's fine because it already works that way right now, but I'm, um, I, I, we discussed it a, a few weeks ago, but um, currently we need to resolve a DIT from the ledger to know the contents of the DIT document because we don't actually store the DIT document when we create it, which is a bit weird. Um, so ideally, I think we need to start storing the DIT document when we create it. So we can at least query like which keys are in the dot, dot, DIT document and we have a local state of the DIT document. It can get out of sync, but that's, I think, another thing to uh, that you can solve now using the import method. So if you modify the DIT document outside of um, AFJ itself, you also have to import the new state into the, uh, the agent. Um, but um, I think... Yeah, for now it's just like it's less efficient because every time we need to know a key in the DIT document, we need to resolve it from the ledger, which is a bit, uh, uh, yeah, it adds overhead. But I think it could be postponed till after the zero for zero release. I think. I tend to think of think that getting the zero for zero out sooner rather than later is better. I think the only consideration on my mind is the if people are working on. Um, offline functionality, it will be, this would be a problem for that, right? Yeah, yeah, but in theory, if you use that DIT, in most cases, the other party would have to resolve it anyway, um, because this isn't an issue with peer DITs, um, which you would probably use often in offline exchanges, I think, right? Got it, uh, that, that is a really good point, <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, we're we're currently because we're currently working on offline exchange, also using Bluetooth, um, which we are finally working. Uh, maybe I can ask someone to give a demo of that soon. Um, but um, there we use peer dits, and that works fine. The only thing we have to do, um, which will be a lot easier with zero for zero, is um, have the schemas and credential definitions in the wallet beforehand because there's no internet. So like we have a predefined set of schemas, credential definitions, those are, uh, and those we can pre-cache and, and uh, have in the wallet for exchange. Yep. Cool. Okay. Then I'm going to not close this issue because it's still relevant, but I'm going to remove it from the zero for zero milestone. Um. Then other things. Oh, this is the wrong repo. Um, oh, now I closed. Oh, let me see. Milestones. Um, zero for zero. Uh, these have PRs open, so that will be quite simple. Update master secret to link secret. Um, is Berent in a call today? He isn't. Um, okay, I think it's just, uh, Ariel, do you know that? I think there was a PR to update the master secret to link secret in Anocrats OS, right? And that's the thing we need to do here um, still. Yeah, but it, isn't that only for, for the API? Because that... <laughs> That, I, that's part of the of the options. I think. I think because the um, the the credential request also includes um, um, these fields. We need to update those. Um, so not sure if it's here. That's not in this one. Um, because if you call create credential request, it will return an object um, with field. So I think this needs to be updated, right? So we we uh, use support a new structure um, that needs to be released. Um, yeah. So if you ah, see the metadata on the metadata, yeah. okay, okay. So that's can I link to this? Uh, yeah. So these. Uh, 
I think the link may have just gone to just the commit, by the way, when you clicked off. Oh, that's not what I want. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, Ah, thanks. Right, so release new version of Anomcrats Rust, um, update field names in AFJ and I think then we probably uh, uh, yeah uh, handle difference between fields names in in the SK still master secret and upgrades for us. Uh, probably extending the migration uh, script to update in the SK generated uh, request method to use link secret and from now on in the in the SK when returning the credential request metadata we changed the keys all right and yeah i think we already have a migration script to update everything to anomcred so i think we can just yeah just change the fields that shouldn't be too much work um cool is anyone that wants to pick up this task that uh yeah i think i can i can do it but but before we have to uh, to to have the the, the release no, and did they release the uh, uh, Anonka the rest, the, the new one? Yeah. Are you going to, to do it? If you I think if you do it? we can make a new release. I think everything is ready. So uh I can pick that up. I think I just have to update the versions and then uh we can make the release. Okay. Cool. Um, awesome. Okay. Then what's left in the milestone? All right. Then I think there was a last few ones in that one yes i want I, I want you to explain me something about that one because you okay. ignored me in the slack so <laughs> i haven't had any time to to work on on Anacrest this week <laughs> yeah go yeah, ahead because, well maybe uh, i i tried to to start on the on this implementation of the uh, the the non-revoked uh, overrides, the 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 timestamp time override for for an unclear arrest, but I I wanted to be sure that I was properly understanding the problem before doing doing so. So, uh, my 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 question, as I say there, is uh, how should I know if I have to present to, to, to provide to the unknown credit rest the, the, the overrides or or not? Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Did the answer from Stephen help or not? Yes, but but I, it, it it was nice to it was good to understand understand uh, better the, the the problem and, and, and how in general the, the 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 application should behave but i don't know uh, how to handle it in regards of that particular uh, overrides that that, it, that is expecting the the, the anonymous rs uh, module because it's okay he he says that 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 that, that uh, we can, we have to reject it if, if if it's if the product 
timestamp is outside of the from or to. But my understanding is that internally, the one who will decide if the, the proof is not correct will be the anon credits arrest module, not not, I mean, that checking, we are not going to do that check in uh, AFJ uh, issuer service, uh, sorry, um, verifier service. Yeah, but I think, yeah. so it's uh, this, my brain always hurts when we bring up this topic again. I understood it <laughs> a few weeks ago and now it's not as fresh in my mind anymore, but um, um, what, how I understand it or like what any, at least what we need to do is I, I understand it, but I'm, I'm not sure if I can um, describe it clearly now is um, um, it's also what Stefan described mostly is we need to check is the um, the proof, the non-revocation proof timestamp that the prover supplied within the from and to range. If so, we can just pass it to um, uh, the Anocrats RS library as is, and we don't need to provide any overrides. Um, if it is outside of the range, we need to check whether it is valid that it is outside of that range. And um, um, that is by querying, I think, as Stefan said, to from and seeing if you get the right. Um, um uh, yeah if you get the right um the same timestamp back and if so um you can pass that as an override you say like it's i know it's outside of the range but the range is for example set for uh 5 minutes yesterday and the timestamp that is provided now is in the past but it is actually the last one published to the ledger so this time step is the valid one for this specific time range even though it's outside of the one of the range because um it's um the timestamp is when the status list was published but uh the status list has an active range which is from a date to a date and if that from and to lies within that range then we need to provide the override. Okay. I think that will not be done in two lines of code. Maybe it's, it's, it's it will it will have some logic because uh, in AFA, I mean, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But because I think the complexity comes when we have these uh, nested non revoked fields because. If we are because in, in the proof we receive we receive uh, an identifier subject I think that have have some has some uh, credential definition IDs uh, uh, and, and, and timestamps so we have to do a loop in all the uh, requested attributes and predicates to see uh, which one. Do you still hear Ariel or? Yeah, I don't hear Ariel anymore. Okay, <laughs> I thought it was my internet or something. <laughs> Ariel, we can't hear you anymore. I think we lost we him. Lost him. <laughs> In the middle of the discussion. I, I guess one of my thoughts though, Tino, from a logic perspective is, do you actually have to do a comparison of the provided timestamp from uh, the prover and meaning, can you just rely on non-creds to uh, do its validation that that's the most recent uh, ledger uh, 
transaction that was posted for the registry, um, rather than trying to determine, okay, is it in this range? Um, and if it's outside, okay, we need to go double check the uh, uh, ledger. Can we just rely on the ledger or the uh, non-creds to do it? But I think the, the limitation is that the unknown creds library doesn't really know about the ledger. It just knows about objects. And so it, it wouldn't really know whether it's the latest or the correct one. So it just, the only thing it can do is check the interval, like the from and the to, and if the timestamp provided is between, but if it outside of there, it doesn't know um, whether that timestamp is valid for that range. The only thing the calling application does know that because it has the ledger and the Anucrets library and the proof and, and together you can, you can gain that knowledge, but otherwise we would need to allow Anuncrets RS to call the ledger, which is the thing we yeah wanted to not have to like Anuncrets itself is now just crypto. Um, so yeah, or do you have a suggestion on how we could approach that and make it simpler? Because I, I really don't like that this is not implemented in Anuncrets Rust, but it's not really possible to implement the nanocrats rust without having a binding to the ledger as as far as i know i think you might be right there um i guess the if i think about it though because the from and the two are going to always be you know, given the guidance for aries are always going to be the same value which means it's highly unlikely <laughs> that you're going to get a um, the transaction is going to be within the from or to. Uh, it's always going to be before or after in 99% of the cases. Yeah. Uh, and I think the two you might be able to just resolve with logic because that says, okay, and <laughs> this is... That one might be easier to deal with. The If it's before the from... You have to do a rev. You have to do a ledger check. You have to get the transaction. Yeah. So the issue being that you're saying is that we need to now handle this on the AFJ side. We can't rely on NDSUK to do it because uh, since we split it up, and non creds shouldn't be able to go talk to the ledger. Well, in the SDK never implemented this, and it's always been something the application layer should have checked because uh, the in the SDK implementation just was, uh, returned verified true. It didn't really check if it was within the range. So that's um, basically we added this because the way it was implemented in the SDK is not really sufficient um, because it was very easy to not do the check because nobody knew it. And the way we changed it now is it will fill. So most verifications will fill. And you need to provide the override for it to be able to pass, which means you're now in a position where it fills by default if it can know it for certain, which I think is better because um, I think most implementations, like the just means that the non verification check is basically useless. Because, well, it's not useless, but it doesn't actually check the time. If you use a timestamp that is outside of the range. <laughs> really? It didn't actually go in and query the ledger previously? No, because in the SDK, even though it supported both ledger and non-ledger, the calls were separated. Um, and for the verify proof method, you don't provide a ledger uh like a pool handle um so uh it's actually kind of a big issue um yeah. in the in the sdk um and this is like why we we thought we can better make it more complex to verify credentials and have it fill by default if it can't know for certain then have the behavior that we had before but it does make the verification process what's already really complex in anonymous more complex but also actually doing the validation that we thought it was previously. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think the added complexity is a, it's 
gross, but I am glad that it you guys have made that change because I think the uh, complicated for us to figure out now, but is is good that we are going to do so. Um, so uh, mm, that that when you say that need to be called a letter, it's like like the Rust library calling or asking for the revocation entries options, right? Is that the what they need to retrieve? Yeah. But yeah, yeah that, that's need to be happen, right? That's should be that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the the nice thing about it is with the new Anoncrats implementation is that we implement this once. And like every ledger that is integrated into AFJ will have that out of the box. So it's like not something um, like if we have it implemented once, it works for Indy, it will work for Cardano, it will work for um, right. uh, 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 checked, like yeah, a check. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I got disconnected for some time, but I think I understood. But, but, um, so something that I, I was wondering is, is when we create the, the, the proof request, uh, we are uh, querying the ledger to get the, the revocation status list and, 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 and everything, right? So at that moment, when we create the proof request, we, we can use the timestamp given, from, given by the, the ledger instead of the one we, we wanted. So that one will be always correct because it's the one from the ledger. I don't think we query the ledger when we create a proof request. I think the proof request is just a JSON object. Um, yeah. But I mean in, in, AF, in AF shape, for instance. In... Do we do that? I don't I think, think we are. To, I don't think you have to query the I may be wrong, but I don't think you have to query the ledger when you create the proof request. When you create the proof, obviously you do, but. Yes. But I, th I uh, maybe, maybe uh, I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding, but I think that, that, that there, are, there, are, there are some steps where we are querying the ledger. For instance, we are querying it for, 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 to get the, the credential definition and, 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 and all that stuff. So um... I, I guess to be specific is the, because According to my understanding, when it comes to proof of uh, requesting proof of non revocation, you're specifying just timestamp. You don't actually do any lookup of the revocation um, deltas or uh, updates. I think you may actually get the re you the map. The most I think you would do is you get the registry, but you don't actually get all the associated deltas and updates to that registry. Yeah, but 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 when you are talking about deltas, you are talking about the way that was was defined in Indy. But now in the in Anon Crest, we have the status lists, the revocation status list. So in my opinion, if 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 you are going to to ask for a non revocation proof, it will be better if you provide. A valid timestamp. But in order to, to not to uh, now is a valid timestamp, um, I think. Yeah, but 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 if you if you if you create a, a proof request, you can ask the ledger to, to see how if what's the the the, the, the most accurate uh, timestamp according to the one you were uh, wanting to to have. So in that way. You will you will ask the the, the, the prover for a timestamp that will be uh, I mean uh, it, 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 it will be the, the 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 last one valid at the time that you were yeah it's asking. it's like put putting the effort now on the on the verifier right but yes we yes. gonna do that we need to, to put that on the specification and on quest so maybe yes. Be... Yeah, I think it will not valid, be any confusion if, if if you if you do so. And also, so usually, I in the in the practical case, usually the the verifier is more powerful than the holder because the holder is usually a mobile device. So we yeah, but we the can... holder also needs to query. So you you won't release the 
the holder to, to do the query. No, but all this stuff we have to do in Avishay to to provide the revocation overrides, it's something that will will add some overhead. Yeah, but the query to the ledger is gonna be also but on the there, holder side. But there, yes, but there will be more queries to the ledger in the holder side. Because we have to, to do the to do because we have we have to we have to do the, the, the regular one, let's say, and also the ones to to provide the, the this uh, overrides to the non-credits library. That's the verifier site that needs to provide or overrides. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Okay. And the verifier, Sorry, like right. if we move it to the request site, um, basically it means you need to do the work then. Um and um Otherwise, you need to do it at the verification process, and like you could okay. already, um, at some point, pre-cache those. Like, if you already know which is the latest, or if it won't change, like there's some way you could like pre-cache that and just say like uh, provide overrides by default or something. Um, but yeah, I think we it doesn't incur extra queries from the ledger. It's just like a yeah. bit more logic to see like right which is timestamp range is valid for which um, uh, timestamp from the ledger for the deltas and the revocation status list. Yeah, 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 you're right. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the same actor who will need to, to do the, the effort. But uh, uh, another question I have is, in the case of the, of in the SDK, uh, because I, I'm, ready, I'm planning to do most of, the, of these changes on, on the uh, anon creds or, in, or legacy in the proof format service before calling the the the, the, the verifier service so in, in the case of of the in the sdk we have to to throw on an error if if we are providing an override or what should we do mm, interesting yeah um ideally we handle it in the anoncrets arrest service. So it's not like specific to the format. Um, um, but yeah, I think we should throw an error in that case than in the in the SDK uh, uh, one, or we should do the verification and we can we can check it afterwards manually um, um, where if there's overrides, because in the SDK just, wouldn't do just won't do the validation so it will actually succeed um um yeah so in that case it it won't be an issue and we could choose to in afj fix the issue from in the sdk uh if we want okay Would there be any concern with doing so in terms of like that then introduces inconsistency between AFJ and Akapai in relation to in the SDK? Um, I'm not sure if that's an issue, but it, we would be introducing a difference in behavior. Yeah, yeah, I think because but I think because it has some implications on security, I wouldn't find that an issue probably ekpai should also make the same change um so yeah. yeah i think that's yeah i i think i agree with you i don't think it's an issue to, <laughs> the inconsistency is is okay but i i'm thinking and i like the idea of just that request be accurate so make sure that you have the from a correct or valid from. There is a little bit of an issue with, with the request side being the correct timestamp I see those that if as a verifier, what I want to say to the prover is, I want to know if your, if your driver's license was valid two weeks ago when you had your accident, right? Uh, it's a very different thing to display to the user Oh, I want to actually know if your driver's license was valid uh, uh, five weeks ago when the last um, Delta was actually posted to the ledger. Uh, so 
Uh, I think that that could be solved with the non-creds 2.0, where you could provide a little bit more information with the non-revocation, where you say, this is the timestamp from the ledger that I want to use, and this is the one I'm trying to verify as valid against, if that makes sense. But dealing with a non-creds v1, I think, um, misses some of the nuance there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think all the we're mostly there. We're fixing small bugs here. Um, the things we're working on right now for the discussion. So, okay, cool. Thanks everyone. And uh, I'll see you next week or actually next week. I won't be here, but uh, yeah. So if somebody else can host, um, please let me know, reach out to me and then uh, yeah, you can host. And otherwise I'll find somebody uh, for someone from my team to host. But if somebody wants to host, please let me know. Thanks, Phil. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.